Hello again. Now that you know how to compute the expected return, variance, and standard deviation of a single stock or a single asset, let's take a look at how do we compute the risk and return for a portfolio. Remember that most of the time we don't want to put all our money in one single stock meaning not putting all our eggs in one single basket. We want to invest and spread our money across multiple assets, meaning multiple stocks, multiple bonds. And when we own more than one single asset, we ha what we have is called a portfolio. So the expected return or the realized return of a portfolio is relatively straightforward. It's simply the weighted average of the underlying securities. So here we have the return of a portfolio is the sum of the weighted average. W here represents the weight. So remember last time we talked about this Greek letter sigma stands for sum. So what we're saying is that the return of a portfolio, whether it's the realized return or the expected return is equal to the weighted average of the underlying stocks. So if you have, for example, Another way of writing the sum is we take the weight for the first stock in the portfolio times the return on the first stock plus the weight on the second stock times the return on the second stock and so on and so forth. And if you have a total of K stocks, then you add it K times. So that's what that summation sign means. So the return of a portfolio is simply the weighted average. The variance of the portfolio is a little bit more complicated. The variance of a portfolio is not a simple weighted average. The reason for that is because variance measures the deviation from the expectation. So when one stock is performing above its expectation, another stock may perform above or below that expectation. And that relationship is called correlation. So if you have more than one stock, you have to take into account how those two stocks react at the same time. So sometimes if stock A outperforms its expectation, stock B may also outperform its expectation. Then we said that the two, two stocks are positively correlated because they either outperform at the same time or they underperform at the same time. On the other hand, other stocks may be negatively correlated, meaning that if stock A outperforms its expectation, stock B underperforms its expectation, and then they offset each other. So that's a much more complex relationship. To help us understand the impacts of diversification, we're going to look at uh, two cases. The first is a two asset case. We just look at a portfolio that has two stocks. And then we're going to expand that to multiple assets and look at how does that impact diversification. And then finally, we're going to drill down to look at what's the difference between the portfolio risk, meaning the risk of your investment as a whole, versus the underlying individual security. So how does each individual security contribute to the overall risk of the portfolio? So let's take a look at an example. This is something that's similar to what you have seen before. So again, we are looking into the future. There are three possible outcomes. So these are the states. The three possible outcomes are that the economy will be in a boom, or it may be neutral, or it may go into a bust. We also have probability associated with each of those states. There's a 20% chance the economy will be in a boom, a 30% chance that it will be neutral, and 50% chance that it will go into a bust. And we have return on two stocks, stock A and stock B. And stock A will return 40% if the economy enters a boom. You will return 12% in a neutral state, and you will lose 5% if the economy enters a bust. So what we're going to do first is to do a review. We're going to compute the expected return and standard deviation for stock A and stock B. I'm going to walk through how to compute the expected return and standard deviation on stock A. I'm going to ask you to pause the video to uh, compute the expected return and standard deviation for stock B on your own. So to compute the expected return, again, I want to make sure that we are emphasizing that we are computing the expected return for stock A. We know it's a sum. We have to take the probability. So first, we take the probability for stay 1. 
which is the boom, there's a 20% chance that will happen. And if that occur, stock A will return 40%. Plus, there is a 30% chance that stock, uh, the economy will be neutral and stock A will return 12%. Finally, there's a 50% chance that the economy will go into a bust. And when that happens, stock A is going to lose 5% or have a negative 0.05% return. So the expected return for stock A is 9.1%. Next, we're going to look at the variance for stock A. So again, we have the same probability. There's a 20% chance that the economy will be a boom. When that happens, stock A is going to generate 40%. But our expectation is only 9.1%. And we need to square that deviation. We do that for the second state, the neutral state. There's a 30% chance that will happen. Stock A will generate 12% in return when our expectation is 9.1%. And we'll square that. Plus, lastly, for the uh, worst day, the bust, there's a 50% chance that will happen. When that happens, stock A is going to lose 5%, so negative 0.05, when we were expecting 9.1%. Again, we'll square that deviation. It turns out that the variance is 0 0.029275. Usually I carry my calculation to four decimal places. But with variance, because the numbers are so, so small, sometimes I carry that to six decimal places just to get a better precision. The standard deviation for stock A is the square root of the variance. And that turns out to be 0.1711 or 17.11%. So here's the expected return and standard deviation for stock A. So pause the video now and go ahead and compute the expected return and standard deviation for stock B. Did you get 3.6% for expected return and 6.1% for standard deviation for stock B? Congratulations. So now we see how the, how the uh, this is a review of things that we have done before. Now we're going to turn to looking at using st combining stock A and stock B into a portfolio. So first, when we construct a portfolio, we have to decide how much money to put into each stock. Uh, we don't really have any good idea in the beginning, so we call this a naive strategy. And we're going to split our money 50-50. We put half of our money in stock A and half of our money in stock B. We're going to go ahead and compute the return for the portfolio in each scenario. So what do we mean by that? So let's take a look at the first scenario. The first scenario is that the economy will, in, will be in, enter into a boom. So if the economy is in a boom, stock A is going to generate a return of 40% and stock B is going to generate a return of 5%. Since we are putting half of our money on stock A and half of our money in stock B, that means our portfolio return will take the weight on stock A times the return on stock A plus the weight on stock B times the return on stock B, and that will give us our portfolio return. So that means half of our money will earn a 40% return, and half of our money is going to earn a 5% return. And it turns out that our portfolio return will be 22.5%. In the case of a neutral market condition, half of our money in stock A we'll get 12%. Half of money is in stock B, which will also give 12%. We don't really have to do any calculation. If half of money get 12%, half of money get 12%, 100% of our money is going to get 12%. So that's going to be our second scenario. In the last scenario, we're going to lose 5% on stock A. So 50 half of our investment is going to lose 5%. Plus, Half of our money is going to be in stock B, which is going to lose 2%. Overall, our portfolio is going to lose 3.5%. So once we have computed our portfolio return, 
Then the rest of the calculation is relatively straightforward. Once we have computed our portfolio return, all we have to do is focus on this. So we can ignore the underlying stock. So imagine you're buying a mutual fund. The mutual fund will only report to you the return on the mutual fund. It will not report to you the underlying stock return um, or in details. It may report the top 10 holdings or the top 50 holdings, but you, you, what you would typically focus on is the summary. How does the portfolio, how does the fund perform as a whole? So now we'll just focus on the probability of the each event happening and how does that impact the portfolio. So you can now compute the uh, expected return and the standard deviation for the portfolio using the same tool that we just did before. So for this portfolio, it has a 20% chance of earning 22.5% a 30% chance of earning 12% and a 50% chance of losing 3.5%. So go ahead and pause the portfolio, uh, pause the video and compute the expected return and standard deviation for this portfolio. Welcome back. Did you get 6.35% for expected return and 10.5% for the portfolio? Congratulations. In this next slide, we have created a, um, an Excel spreadsheet inside the PowerPoint file. And to allow you to experiment with different portfolio weight to see how, this, uh, how would that impact the expected return and the standard deviation of the portfolio. If you double click on the spreadsheet, you'll be able to access the cells in itself. So remember in our original case, we have 50% and 50% on the two stock, and that gives us our expected return and our standard deviation that you just calculated. You can, we can change that, so we can change the, the distribution and say, let's put 20% in stock A and 80% in stock B. And here's something that's very important. Always check to make sure that the weight sums up to one. And we see that we have a slightly lower expected return, but also a lower standard deviation. You can try different combinations. So go ahead and pause the video and open up the um, PowerPoint slide and enter different uh, weights in there so to see how does changing the weight. So for example, instead of 90-10, what happens if you put 90% of your money in stock A and 10% in stock B? How does that affect your overall expected return and standard deviation? So portfolio weights obviously is very important. So I'm gonna take a minute to talk about uh, what they are and how do we determine them. One of the most important thing to remember about portfolio weight is that it should be based on market value. So what do we mean by market value? Let's take a look at some example. Say stock A is selling at $15 per share and stock B is selling at 10% per share. You currently own 400 shares of stock A and 400 shares of stock B. What is your portfolio weight? If you think that your portfolio weight is 50-50, that will be unfortunately wrong because portfolio weight is not based on number of shares, but based on market value. Market value means that you take the price of the stock times the number of shares. So it's how much value you have invested in a stock altogether. So for stock A, you invested $15 over 400 shares. So you invested a total of $6,000 in stock A. For stock B, it is $10. You also have 400 shares. So you invested a total of $4,000 in stock B. Altogether, your total market value is $10,000. You invested a total of $10,000 between the two stocks. Now you can compute the weight on stock A and the weight on stock B. So the weight, the weight for stock A will be the $6,000 divided by the total. So 6,000 divided by 10,000 is 60%. For stock B, is 4,000 divided by the total, 
4,000 divided by 10,000 is 40%. So now we have just finished computed our, our weight. So the weight for stock A is 60%, and the weight for stock B is 40% in our example. So go ahead and try out on your own what happens if you change the number of shares. If you own only 200 shares of stock A and 300 shares of stock B, what would the weight be? Pause the video and do the calculation. Welcome back. Did you get 50% in stock A and 50% in stock B? Congratulations. We will end this video here. In the next video, we're going to look at portfolio risk in detail.